Hello and welcome to this webinar on the South-South Replication Toolkit. We will be looking today at the Dimagi case study and trying to see how uh, a social enterprise uh, found in 2002 and uh, at Harvard and MIT Media Lab was replicated in another context. And we'll be looking at how the uh, South Asia Inclusive Business Program of the IFC created a replication tool that helped uh, uh, take it to another geography and another context. So um, I have uh, the pleasure of moderating this session. My name is Somil Nagpal. I'm a senior health specialist at the World Bank based in New Delhi. And uh, uh, I've been with the World Bank for six years and currently look after uh, the World Bank's portfolio in India and a few other countries here. Uh, with me, uh, the two speakers that we will be featuring today are Rishad Gambhir and Pallavi Srivastava. Rishad is the project manager India team of Dimagi, the company that we are going to be talking about. Uh, so Rishad, when he's not doing discoveries of new cuisines, sites and structures, uh, is busy implementing creative evidence-based interventions in low resource communities. He's worked as an analyst at the National Economics uh, Research Associates in New York City, completed the Starting Block Institute for Social Innovation and is now at Dimagi. Uh, Pallavi, who leads the IFC uh, South Asia Inclusive Business Program, uh, has been instrumental in setting up this uh, joint World Bank IFC program and is leading these key interventions for the inclusive business and impact investing industry and also supporting IFC's inclusive business investments uh, for both profitability and for South-South application. Prior to this, she also implemented the very successful development marketplace program that provides funding and technical assistance to very innovative development solutions uh, uh, and uh, on that note I am going to be inviting Pallavi to make a, a short uh, uh, presentation followed by uh, Rishad and, and then we will be opening it up for question and answers. Uh, I invite Pallavi. Thank you Somal for the kind introduction. Uh, hi everyone and welcome to this webinar on South-South Replication Toolkit. I thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is Pallavi and as Somal mentioned, I work with the World Bank Group where I currently manage the South Asia Inclusive Business Program uh, and more broadly focus on scaling the impact of sustainable inclusive business models. Uh, the, the way we, what the World Bank Group defines inclusive business models is enterprises that integrate the low income uh, populations and uh, communities into their value chains as producers, as suppliers or as consumers. Um, and in, over the last few years, we are seeing that uh, inclusive business activity is on the rise, uh, where we are seeing a lot of, uh, uh, you know, large corporates driving the uh, BOP agenda, which is a bottom of the population related interventions uh, by designing products and services which can cater to uh, addressing some of the development challenges. On the other side, we are seeing some, uh, some enterprises coming up with uh, bottom-up approaches which we call social enterprises uh, who are looking at uh, creating innovative cost-effective products and services uh, to address development challenges um, and uh, we have seen that you know a lot of uh, inclusive business models in India in Africa and in South Asia regions where uh, we've been working over the last two years uh, that they have been demonstrated their potential to, uh, to to address some of the critical challenges at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, and so uh, we have, uh, oh, what we're trying at the South Asia Inclusive Business Program for the last two years is looking at some of these interventions and seeing, you know, where is the biggest uh, need from the sector and we're trying to respond to some of these. Uh, one of the key um, uh, challenges that's coming more, uh, you know, in front of us is around replication. And uh, with a huge amount of information sharing, we are seeing that a lot of enterprises are now uh, considering replication as a, as a potential uh, tool to take their enterprises to the next level of scale. Um, uh, so, uh, so what we did, uh, you know, over the last uh, one and a half years, we've been working a lot around understanding this space and trying to see what, how IFC and the World Bank Group can support uh, some of this work. Um, so I will be presenting today uh, specifically on uh, some of our learnings uh, that we gathered over uh, uh, the course of our study. Uh, so, and also a successful uh, replication tool that we developed with the help of our consulting partner in Telecap uh, to, to uh, present uh, uh, a framework that can help enterprises replicate sustainably in a new market. Um, 
so uh, so we started with uh, you know hypothesis of you know that there is a case for replication but we really wanted to see what is it and you know while there is a huge demand from inclusive businesses uh, we wanted to understand if you know there is an interest in the uh, development uh, sector and the private sector communities in these markets to support cross border replication uh, at the same time uh, we also wanted to understand more based on our research that whether there is really a potential for inclusive businesses to go to another market and successfully expand and and in what form you know can they really solve the challenges that they are able to solve in their home geography in the same way uh, in other markets and um, and thirdly which is very important is um, that uh, very often you know in, in, we 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 encourage enterprises to go to a new market to see a new uh, you know uh, way of doing uh, business and you know being able to expand or impact but is there uh, the ecosystem in that target market ready and does it have the capacity and readiness to be able to um, support this growth further uh, and then finally the the most important question for us was that what what are the specific intervention that we can design for inclusive businesses that can be most effective in achieving these goals um so um, so coming to the uh, the next slide which is uh, specifically on uh, you know the results coming out of our discussions with a number of stakeholders that we spoke with including the donors uh, development finance institutions um, multilaterals investors and we found that there is a huge demand for proven inclusive business models so if you have a great technology a product a, a, a different way of doing things in business and operating models or or you develop knowledge and expertise over time uh, there is a high chance that, uh, that that this can be replicated to other markets to solve the same challenges um, and the simple premise behind this is that uh, the countries in india south asia africa and the global south share very common uh, socio economic context and you know that uh, because of the regional similarities and similarities in the challenges we have seen that the business models are really adaptable um uh we saw that you know we also uh, speaking with donors and investors their point of view has been that uh, you know we want to uh, maximize the efficiency in the in the dollar value and you know the amount that we are spending and the limited resources that we have um so uh, so there is they they definitely are wanting to see some of the proven solutions rather than reinventing the wheel and learning from those successes and implementing them elsewhere um we've seen over the last two years that there have been a lot of programs initiated by other donors uh, global investors are supporting their portfolio firms from india to replicate in africa um in south asia the impact investing activity has been on the rise uh, and so but but what has been the biggest challenge is that while there is a huge interest we don't see that there is a formal support ecosystem which means that the knowledge sharing platforms or you know enterprises trying to uh develop uh, solutions that can really do this in a sustainable manner so one of the big things that came for us was to create a formal support ecosystem to capture this demand and encourage replication uh so the first step was uh, to create more awareness around what really works um and so we uh, we looked at uh, uh 20 case studies overall we have done this study in two phases the phase one uh, study was uh, and we've aptly called it uh, building corridors for shared prosperity the first corridor we looked at was uh, india africa where we analyzed 11 successful business models uh, which have uh, successfully moved from india to africa and in the second phase we are looking at now which is undergoing is uh, nine cases of intra south asia replication and which is also uh, bidirectional uh, which means that we are not only looking at corridors where um, an enterprise move from india to other markets but it's 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 multidirectional in a way where we're looking at uh, different markets and different scenarios um in terms of the sectors we found that um uh, the the biggest need is in the um and the biggest replication uh, opportunity lies in the three sectors that we have identified here which is uh, agriculture healthcare and renewable energy in that order uh, and finally we identified uh, you know which focus uh, countries uh, are the ones where uh, there is a highest potential so we've analyzed looked at a lot of macro data and you know seeing uh, where the markets really lie um, and we have identified five uh, countries in africa where we have put out a lot of details and i will talk about it later when i present the replication framework um and uh, so so what this has led to is that what you're seeing in the three boxes here um we have our industry report uh, that that you know you can download and i will share the link uh, which talks about uh, the insights and learnings from these experiences um 
Then we have companion uh, guides related to the case studies that, that we studied uh, in detail. And finally, all this has led to uh, developing the replication toolkit um, that, that, that's uh, the focus of this presentation today. Uh, it's, it's an Excel-based toolkit which has a, a checklist and you know, self-diagnostic uh, checklist to improve replication readiness. Um, so here, uh, what we're seeing is uh, a list of um, the case studies that we looked at in both the phases. Uh, and they, but I want to draw your attention to the last two columns, which uh, talk about the replication format and the country region. And um, so, so we tried to deconstruct what really replication is. And we found that you know uh, enterprises do not really have a lift and shift approach to replication, but there are several formats in which uh, uh, enterprises are uh, approaching expansion and it ranges from um, depending on the, the the degree of control that an enterprise wants uh, versus you know what is the kind of investment required and the risk uh, it ranges from knowledge sharing to uh, joint venture trade partnerships and finally coming to uh, setting up your own operations or acquiring a firm in the target market and um, so what we see saw here is that you know in case of India Africa we had about half the enterprises which which went about setting up their own operations while in case of intra south asia replication we are seeing that you know six out of nine which is two third enterprises uh, really went about uh, setting up partnerships which is uh, driven by you know the the kind of markets in south asia related to uh, the the you know the nascent environment in terms of inclusive business and impact investing activity as well as um, uh, you know the constrained bilateral relations between some of the markets uh, in terms of the countries and regions, uh, we found that in phase one, uh, most of the enterprises looked at Kenya as an entry point, uh, given the, the developed market in terms of uh, inclusive business and, you know, presence of a large number of investors. Uh, so, so a lot of, uh, you know, places where you're seeing sub-Saharan Africa is basically the entry point for them has been Kenya. Um, and then uh, they are looking at, you know, making um, Kenya as a hub for East Africa and, you know, not really thinking about a country specific approach, but a region specific approach. Uh, in phase two, uh, we are seeing that most of the replication activity is originating from India and moving to Bangladesh uh, uh, simply because India is a more evolved market, um, you know, for coming up with huge number of social enterprises and inclusive business models that we see here. Uh, this is followed by uh, Bangladesh and, uh, uh, you know, next is uh, Nepal and finally Sri Lanka. We did not come across any model in Sri Lanka that has really moved to other markets, you know, during our study. Um, coming to the next slide, uh, you know, this is, uh, we wanted to put some science behind, uh, you know, what is it that really works in successful replication. And, uh, and we found that, uh, you know, um, we spoke with uh, 100, uh, over 100 industry stakeholders uh, with the help of our consulting team and also, uh, you know, 20 inclusive businesses uh, that we looked at. And we found that these are the seven uh, key areas where, um, uh, you know, the, the insights can be bucketed into. Uh, first is uh, the replicability of the business model, which is uh, very critical. Um, in, in this, we, uh, you know, we looked at, uh, uh, you know, uh, the product-based versus service-based organizations and given the challenges and the cost of doing business, which, which effectively becomes four to five times of your, uh, you know, cost of your home market, uh, we found that um, the replicability uh, for product-based, uh, uh, you know, c companies or inclusive businesses, which, uh, uh, which, which can absorb higher margins, uh, which have higher margins and can absorb the higher cost of doing business, uh, were more replicable compared to the service-based models. Uh, similarly, we found that urban-centric models, which get a higher population density and hence customer base uh, in, a, in, in the urban scenario, were more uh, replicable compared to the rural-centric models. Um, in terms of the objectives of replication, uh, we've, we, we're seeing that there really are two different uh, reasons why enterprises replicate. One could be your business driven imperative and the other could be that, you know, the, an external motive where uh, you might have access to a grant. Uh, and very often, you know, in the sample set that we studied, we found that uh, business driven transfers where enterprises have, uh, you know, had a clear uh, articulation of what their needs are, whether they want to expand their impact or, or their revenue or, you know, uh, have a global presence were um, uh, were more successful compared to externally driven motives. Um, 
for example if i can just give an example of one of the enterprises we looked at uh, which is arvind eye care uh, which uh, which whose mission is to eliminate needless blindness uh, there are um, uh, and which is a not for profit which is also an inclusive business model because it does have a revenue model that really uh, looks at uh, you know um, doing uh, uh, financial sustainability and viability of its operations uh, we found that in uh, in case of um, arvind eye care they looked at uh, the they wanted to expand the impact of their business models and not so much on the revenue and which is the reason why they have expanded to 300 uh, uh, you know different hospitals um, and by sharing their knowledge and you know their business model so knowledge sharing is the platform uh, the format that really worked well for them um, third is on the systematic preparation and i can't emphasize more on this as i uh, if you know our initial hypothesis was that enterprises which have a uh, uh, which are at a growth stage or a mature stage are more apt for transfer and can really be more successful and you know achieve scale and viability faster but we were surprised to see that you know half of the cases that we studied were really early stages with less than uh, 4 years of vintage uh, which led us to uh, you know understand and, and deconstruct it further to see that what is it that they did which led them to be successful in a new market being uh, being very early into their business and we found that you know the the biggest reason was that they really took time to develop their management financial and operational capacities and you know approached it in a more systematic manner uh, and that was the reason uh, for uh, for for their success one uh, exciting example that we looked at is of an <coughs> organization called as manasa agro which produces lemongrass in india and uh, they found that you know uh, in the initial few years they expanded to africa to find a cost effective markets and uh, currently, 80% of their revenue is coming from their Africa operations. So we found such similar examples, uh, which actually led us to also bring these insights into developing the uh, the framework. Um, appropriate entry markets is is critical. Um, you know, to identify which which is the right market for you. And uh, one of the things that our framework also helps us helps to enterprises do is uh, not only uh, identify. Uh, how to select that entry market, but we've also done, uh, you know, case studies on, you know, uh, the data on different countries, which can really be an appropriate entry market, and we have given some some details around that. <clears throat> Next is adapting to local context, which is critical. Um, adaptation can be in many forms. It can be um, tweaking your business, tweaking your product, you know, understanding the customers, and you know, catering to different customer segments. And also sometimes shifting your distribution strategies, for example. Um, an interesting case that I can talk about here is of a large pharma company uh, called as Novartis. And they have a social uh, a program called as uh, Aruge Parivar, uh, wherein uh, they use doctors to, uh, to, you know, to, in order to uh, help uh, rural poor. They talk about uh, doctor consultations and then also uh, uh, provide a sale of generic drugs, which is a byproduct of their social business, uh, where, the, where they are able to, uh, to reach out to the rural poor, giving them consultations. And also, that leads to the business side of it, where they are able to sell their generic drugs. Uh, in case of Kenya, when they entered the market, they realized that you know, while they can give the medical consultations, uh, the, and the kind of uh, you know, lab tests or the, uh, the kind of uh, uh, you know, inputs that they gave to the customers or the sale of generic drugs were really not an option for people. And hence, they had to adapt their business model to also start including lab tests and also selling the generic medicines, which was not the case in the India uh, operations. Uh, so these are some of the so the, some of the examples that you know we have also highlighted in our report uh, and you know case studies that we can look at. Um, local partnerships are critical. They can be um, simple commercial partnerships where you are partnering to sell your product or service, or they can be also strategic partnerships. You know where you are thinking about uh, exploring, uh, you know, building a local identity, or you know just uh, understanding and learning from each other. Um, uh, very often we saw that you know sometimes you need to have a partner on the ground from the local uh, market, even for regulatory reasons such as uh, registering your business or it can be um, you know to acquire assets such as land or raw materials, uh, fixed assets. Um, and finally, a phased approach uh, is is important. Uh, mostly businesses think about you know in, um, looking at and because of the resource constrained nature of social enterprises and inclusive businesses. Uh, they they cannot really go full scale into a new market. So uh, you know most of the work is done from their home country, 
and uh, and going to uh, the next level where they develop partnership arrangements and then finally thinking about doing pilots and then then going full scale into a new market um, so these were some of the learnings and and while it's a lot of it is intuitive and uh, um, you know very often we hear from businesses that uh, when they made these decisions the long term impact of these decisions were not very clear and very often uh, it was not a linear approach but doing two or three uh, steps at a time um, so but the bigger question uh, that we've been hearing is you know how how we go about this process how do i know whether uh, my business is ready to replicate uh, how do i uh, identify the appropriate entry markets or or build the right partnership or you know uh, what is the steps that i need to follow in order to systematically prepare and you know build the capacities for replication and that is something um, that we attempted to answer through the framework uh, um, so here um, we uh, the framework really has uh, three key pillars. Um, the first one uh, is talks to your objectives, as I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, is basically on your intent. Uh, so understanding uh, what is uh, what are the objectives and you know clearly laying them out is critical. It is also important to to do that to to establish your market need and uh, at the same time it helps you identify your uh, your control preferences whether you're able to take losses in the first few years um, how much of an effort is needed to uh, for market validation for example and i think uh, this is one of the key pillars uh, we in the framework really ask asks you to actually introspect and put all these out and you know very clearly articulate your objectives your preferences and Finally, thinking through on um, how how what kind of preferences you have in working with partnerships, for example. Um, second step to it is uh, is on capacity on um, how do you really develop your uh, management capacity? You know, do you have a dedicated full time staff who can put their efforts on um, on replication in a new market rather than affecting your home country operations? Um, how do you really allocate your funds and where will that come from? So building your financial capacity to be able to take the initial losses and you know having the surplus and not affecting your home operations is something that 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 needs to be uh, done to you know and also locking having allocated resources for expansion is critical third is um, on your operational capacity where uh, you know we we encourage enterprises to think about their decision making structures and what are their competitive strengths that you know and, and standardized processes that can really take to the new market um, you know, in a in an easy to uh, to replicate manner. Uh, so while the first two uh, pillars are internally driven, the last one is uh, is more focuses on the external uh, factors, which is the macroeconomic uh, environment in a country, and and the kind of dependencies a business has. So this can be broken down into three uh, key areas. The first one is on um, basically seeing you know it's important that the the market is politically stable, for example. Uh, should have uh, a good investment climate, incentives to do business, uh, so things like that. And this is something that we don't ask enterprises to put, but a lot of this work has been done by us in the replication framework. And we have this data into the framework uh, that really assesses and, and tells which is the right market. And that's been the um, one of the key um, uh, you know factors that has fed into us selecting the markets that already exist in the in the in the toolkit. Um, the second one is on the um, sectoral dependencies, uh, for example, the kind of policy environment needed for a specific sector. If, if you're an agribusiness enterprise and you depend on agri-extension workers, uh, then you need to have those aggregators and you know cooperatives, or uh, sometimes it might be related to raw material for a particular sector in say, renewable energy. And finally, the organization level dependencies, um, and I can quickly take an example uh, you know, from 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 the Magi, maybe you know where we are, where the Magis looks at you know the availability of frontline workers, and uh, uh, you know having technical technically sound uh, talent from that market. Uh, so, so these are the three key pillars, and um, so this basically goes into the replication toolkit, uh, which uh, which is an uh, Excel based uh, uh, online uh, downloadable toolkit, and on the bottom left is where you can see the link where you can download it from um, and while it's difficult for us to show the entire uh, toolkit but i will try to uh, show it through this slide as to how it practically works uh, 
Um, so the, the, the ping boxes that you're seeing are, are actually talk back to the framework in the previous slide that you saw where uh, it really asks you a set of questions on your business information, whether you are a product company or a service company, uh, whether uh, you are uh, you know, not for profit or a for profit or a hybrid uh, uh, enterprise, and also um, certain other questions on your vintage, etc. Imperatives and preferences is basically your intent, where we have a number of questions uh, that that go into understanding um, what is it that you know uh, that you're looking at from this expansion, uh, what kind of control preferences you have, you know, which lead to deciding whether uh, which kind, what kind of a partnership you will enter into in a new market. Uh, capacities is something uh, where uh, you know we we break it down to the three capacities I talked about earlier, which is management, financial, and uh, um, um, you know, operational capacity and then within each one of them there are a number of questions what is the bandwidth of your current staff to take up uh, the replication activity uh, do you have a second line of leadership uh, in management and similarly in financial where it asks a number of questions on your uh, financial strength uh, uh, and and funding plans for replication and finally on the business dependencies uh, like I mentioned the macroeconomic data is uh, already entered but Businesses need to input information on um, their uh, organizational dependencies, you know, whether they, they integrate the low income as consumers or suppliers. So these kind of questions get into it. And once this data has been inputted from the inclusive businesses, uh, there is a backend uh, analysis that goes into it based on the data that we have put in and as well as the analysis. Uh, so there's certain weightage is given to each of the responses and which then finally leads to a diagnostic result uh, which which basically talks around three main areas one is that it tells you whether your market whether your business is ready for expansion or not uh, if it's not then it tells you what are the three uh, you know capacity needs that you know where is what are your strengths and weaknesses and what really you need to do in order to reach that readiness level and the second is, uh, you know, and if, if it is ready, then it really tells you what are the most suitable markets for you and which is the right format. So you can think of it as a checklist of sorts, you know, where you you you, are, you ask all these questions, you put this data and, you know, you try to get uh, responses on your readiness um, on the right markets and right formats for replication. Um, so, so please have a look at it, you know, you can download it and it's more of a navigational tool, but at the same time, we encourage enterprises to do their own uh, due diligence and you know uh, seek support as as needed. Um, so here, uh, you know, please uh, please look at it and you know do share your feedback. Uh, you know what you think and and we are continuously trying to refine this. Uh, in the second phase, we are coming up with a more refined version and trying to add more markets, more sectors into it. Um, and finally, uh, coming to the Dimagi case study. Uh, Dimagi, as you know, is a global social enterprise. It provides open source mobile platforms and they have an interesting platform called Escomcare that supports frontline workers and um, so what we're seeing here is we have been uh, we did a workshop back in April and uh, we uh, we assist a couple of enterprises and we found that Dimagi is is a case where you know it can be taken to the next level in terms of in South Asia markets where they were exploring to uh, to enter uh, and we uh, we did a scoping mission in Myanmar and we, we decided that you know we'll be looking at how we can uh, work together um, uh, to in terms of financial and technical assistance with IFC uh, to assist the Myanmar market to develop a replicable model which can then be uh, taken to other South Asian markets as well. Uh, so I will let uh, Rishad talk more about it, uh, uh, you know, our learnings from the Myanmar experience and, uh, and uh, I will be back later to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone, and good evening for uh, those joining us from uh, Asia. Uh, thank you very much, Pallavi, for uh, that introduction and for the excellent presentation of the Replication Toolkit. Um, I will go ahead and speak about the Magi's experience in Myanmar and how we expanded there. But before that, just some contextual information. Uh, as Pallavi mentioned, we are a social enterprise and we design as well as deploy uh, mobile tools for frontline workforces. Uh, our primary sector of focus has been health, but we've also explored uh, and expanded into other sectors that include agriculture, uh, water and sanitation, and uh, social sales. 
Uh, we were founded in 2002 out of MIT Media Labs in Cambridge. Uh, and since then, we've opened uh, country offices in uh, India, South Africa, um, and Senegal, with our headquarters being in Cambridge. But we do have in-country staff in uh, a number of uh, geographies that include uh, Kenya, Mozambique, and of course, uh, Myanmar. What uh, you currently see on your screen is our trajectory into Myanmar. Um, and this, uh, the, our Myanmar operations were operated out of our regional hub in India. Uh, there were a number of factors that uh, made us decide uh, on Myanmar as a really good testing ground to see if uh, our products and services would uh, fit both the needs uh, as well as the, uh, the landscape uh, in Myanmar. And uh, we started off in around May 2014, so almost a year and a half ago. Uh, we started off with a TV project. Uh, that was our first project in Myanmar. We had explored the TV sector previously in India and South Africa, had run a couple of pilots. So the sector itself uh, was not, uh, was not you know, something which was uh, new to us. Uh, we took those lessons and applied it to this specific project that uh, uh, you know, started off in Myanmar. The uh, project itself provided a really good opportunity to explore uh, Myanmar as a strategic kind of opportunity uh, for expanding other operations. It provided us an opportunity to uh, gauge what the market potential was for an mHealth tool such as uh, ComCare. And uh, through our experiences with uh, this pilot, we uh, explored uh, all the different you know, reasons which would make sense for us to expand into Myanmar. Um, there were a number of them. Uh, one was that uh, uh, technologically, uh, there were uh, a lot of factors that would spur the growth of uh, mobile technology in Myanmar. The prices of SIM cards, for example, was drastically dropping. And even since May 2014, it has uh, dropped uh, from around $120 to $1 per SIM card. Uh, there was a lot of interest uh, among the NGO uh, scene as well as uh, the government to introduce technology into healthcare, uh, as well as a number of other development-related services. Uh, this provided fertile ground for us to consider Myanmar as you know, a, 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 an office for our satellite operations. And uh, we decided to then uh, send one of our staff members to the country uh, and you know, she would be based out of there permanently while we would provide reinforcements from our hub in India. Uh, an important replication strategy that we followed, which coincides with uh, you know, the second point on the slide is about building a community in Myanmar. Since we had only one team member there, uh, but at the same time, there was a lot of excitement for uh, mobile technology, and uh, there was uh, a lot of aptitude to uh, you know, even build your own application. Uh, we decided to pursue uh, the, uh, the strategy of engaging with self-starts, um, and one, uh, one thing that made that possible is that ComCare is a user configurable platform. We, uh, we have a front end and anyone can create an account, uh, build their own application and deploy it without any knowledge of programming. Uh, it's, it's a drag and drop tool um, and you, know, you would need to have your programmatic protocols in place and then you would use the platform uh, you know, to deploy the application uh, and design it as well. So we wanted to test uh, the, you know, the market in Myanmar for that. Uh, we got a lot of interest from a number of self starts. And uh, as a result, we also uh, hosted a number of workshops in Yangon, starting off with uh, a major workshop last September. So that's September 2014 uh, to get uh, a number of mHealth uh, uh, number of NGOs interested in him health to interact with each other, uh, discuss the common issues that were being faced, discuss the challenges, but then arrive at some consensus on the path forward. 
Uh, in addition to this, we held a number of uh, advanced capacity and uh, com care training workshops. Uh, these were also met with a lot of success. And uh, hand in hand, there was a lot of interest even from the government um, in using technology. Myanmar is, gone, is at an interesting moment where it's undergoing uh, a lot of system strengthening, whether it's in healthcare or in agriculture. And uh, it's unique in the sense that uh, the different players, including the NGOs as well as the government, are thinking of introducing technology at the outset instead of uh, you know, building the system and then have technology come in later. That was an interesting opportunity for us to inform that uh, discussion and try and be a part of that dialogue. And uh, that's why Myanmar made sense uh, as a market as well. Uh, we, we spurred a number of cell starts. And then, of course, from you know, pilots, you think about uh, making an impact at scale. And that's where we uh, started to focus on our M Health expansion strategy. And uh, starting in June uh, this year, uh, we uh, started an engagement with the government as well as a key um, key stakeholder and a key NGO based in Myanmar to uh, develop an application for midwives. Uh, a couple of uh, factors in the Myanmar health landscape uh, made it easy to uh, assess the need for this. Uh, like India, uh, a Majority of Myanmar's population resides in rural areas with limited access to healthcare. Uh, healthcare is, is fairly decentralized there. Um, and as such, extension workers or community health workers play a key role in uh, counseling, uh, you know, beneficiaries, providing key maternal and child health services, um, and taking healthcare to the last mile. And that's where we come in as uh, you know, a technology company uh, and where our, our products can play a very important role. So given these factors, uh, the M Health ex expansion strategy uh, worked out and uh, we, we are currently uh, just in the preliminary stages of this project, but it's, it's kind of like our big project there. And uh, we, with it, we hope to make uh, an impact at scale. Side uh, alongside that, we uh, once we had targeted health in Myanmar and you know put that on uh, our radar, health being our primary sector of uh, focus, we also wanted to start exploring other sectors uh, such as agriculture and renewables, um, sectors in which we have demonstrated, um, a, you know, demonstrated experience, demonstrated impact uh, in other countries, but uh, not in Myanmar. And as Pallavi had mentioned earlier, uh, customization is really important in you know, the replication toolkit. So we wanted to specifically understand what the Myanmar landscape looks like for these sectors that we were interested in. Uh, as a result, uh, IFC and Dimagi uh, engaged in collaboration, uh, whereby IFC has, uh, has uh, engaged a local consultant based in Myanmar for us to explore these sectors. Um, and validate the key use cases in them so that we can uh, take this to the next level. Uh, moving on to the key determinants, uh, determinants of our expansion into Myanmar, I've touched upon these, and uh, many of these tie in with the replication framework that Pallavi had noted earlier from uh, the dependencies to the intent uh, to the capacity that was needed for this expansion. Uh, one of the key decision points was the rising uh, use of mobiles and you know, just the lower, uh, the lower costs in accessing mobile technology. One example that I'd given earlier was about the, the plummeting costs of SIM cards. Um, and in general, the enthusiastic response that uh, you know, the use of mobiles was receiving in Myanmar. Moreover, the government uh, landscape was uh, fertile and a lot of NGOs, as well as the Myanmar government, especially the Ministry of Health, was interested in mHealth, uh, interested in using technology in addition to strengthening their systems. Um, there was also an opportunity to inform system strengthening. Uh, so as I mentioned, technology was not only introduced as a layer upon uh, you know, existing health systems, those health systems were being built, but at the same time, technology was being introduced. And uh, there was 
uh, little competition at that point in time. So it was a key uh, key time to make those inroads. Um, it, there was also our ability to keep operational costs low. We sent a dedicated uh, team member to Myanmar, but our strategic operations were uh, were backstopped and you know reinforced from our regional hub in India. And we followed a phased approach where you know we build a community, we uh, get a big M hub in engagement, and then we think about expanding our uh, our staff in Myanmar. So this was really helpful. At the same time, there was a potential for high impact, and for uh, Dimagi, impact is a very important priority given the need for uh, you know technology in the health sector, especially at the frontline services sector. Uh, given the you know the health indicators that existed in Myanmar uh, and that still exist, which demonstrate that there is a lot of effort that can be put into improving these health indicators. And since a lot of these health services are provided by frontline workforces, uh, it's about strengthening the frontline workforces. And that's where uh, mobile technology comes in. So that was a key determinant uh, and a key dependency in this in, in this sense as well. And finally, the high literacy rate and the aptitude for technology. There was a lot of buzz, uh, there still is, uh, in promoting ICT4D uh, and you know, getting different technology players to work together um, and you know, even promoting a number of self-starts in Myanmar. So all of these tie into the different uh, points that Pallavi mentioned earlier. Um, and we, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's really interesting to see how this is tied in with the replication framework introduced by the IFC. I will hand it over right now to Samuel to take it up. Thank you, Rishabh. So we've had two excellent presentations. Uh, thank you, Pallavi and Rishabh. That was uh, really uh, very informative. And um, we already have a bunch of questions on the screen. So let me start with uh, a few that have already come. And we'll wait for more to come. Uh, and thank you to our colleagues for also sharing the materials online. And you can see the links are all on the chat box that you can use. So Dr. Josephine Balati from Tanzania wanted to know more details about when the study was done in Tanzania. Uh, David from Germany from the Impact Business Action uh, uh, Acceleration Network wanted to know whether the toolkit uh, guides on which replication strategy would be most appropriate. And uh, 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 Arun from the World Bank Group wanted to know the average years of experience of the uh, social enterprises uh, in Africa and in South Asia. So maybe we get started with these and I'll come back with more questions. Sure. So um, just going back to the timing for this study, uh, we started in uh, uh, 2014 towards the end and we, uh, we launched uh, the study um, in February 2015. Um, so, uh, so I think the timing for Tanzania and you know, when we were studying all the markets, was around uh, November, uh, December 2014 is, is when we were we were there and you know our consulting team was there and you know we were speaking with different enterprises. Uh, to answer the second question, which is uh, does the toolkit um, guide on which replication strategy would be the most appropriate? I think that's the the main point for the toolkit to actually assess. Uh, uh, you know, so it, it it really answers three key questions uh, and that's the way we can use it. One is to assess whether an enterprise is really ready. So before actually guiding on what your replication strategy should be like, what we're encouraging enterprises to do is to really see if they're, they have the readiness to be able to replicate and you know go to the next market, which really talks back to the framework where we help you assess your intent, your objectives, your capacities, your team, your financial resources. So it helps you take all these uh, you know, things into consideration when you're thinking about replication. Uh, on the replication strategy per se, this, this comes to the second point. Once it says that you are ready, and you know, once you know you're ready, um, the the bigger question is that you know, what should your strategy be? And strategy can really be deconstructed from our replication toolkit point of view into two main decisions. One is that uh, which is the right market for me, and the second is what is the right replication format? You know, whether I should go for a trade partnership. You know, if I'm a product company, or you know, should I go about uh, just the knowledge sharing and you know licensing arrangement or should I set up my business you know so there are really are different formats and uh, what I forgot to mention during the presentation is that you know when you download the toolkit apart from the excel based diagnostic tool you also have 
a number of check checklists. I think about there are about 10, and 10 to 12 uh, such checklists which really talk about how you can go about um, building your capacity, say financial capacity, how you can go about building your management bandwidth. And then also you have case studies which you can look at how similar enterprises in your sector went about doing this. Um, and the second part is about, you know, once you choose a, choose a format, the, the question that enterprises face is how do I find this partner? It's expensive and you know, how do I go about it? So for each format, there is again a checklist that talks to your business and you, know, you can think about, uh, you know, reading from others' experiences and, and reading this checklist as to how you can go. Uh, but but on that, I would say that, you know, partnership development is something that enterprises school need to, this is more of a guiding tool, uh, but need to do their, your own, uh, you know, efforts and due diligence and, you know, build your relationships in the new market um, to, you know, to think once you know which market is, maybe that can be the right starting point for you to start building those relationships. And the final question on average uh, years of uh, uh, experience for for a social enterprise uh, to run in. So there is no, um, or, you know, no one answer to it. Like I mentioned, our initial thinking was that, you know, an enterprise should be uh, mature enough or even at least in the growth stage where they have sorted out their India operations or, you know, wherever they are coming from, uh, you know, in the, in the home country and saturated the market enough. And then think about, you know, because then you have processes, you have the people and, you know, you have a little bit more resources to think about expansion. Uh, but uh, what we found was, which is very surprising for us, was that half of the enterprises were really early stage with less than four years into existence. So I think um, what we could, uh, you know, when we spoke with them, uh, what we understood and what the toolkit also, uh, you know, kind of brings into uh, into into practice is uh, that you need to um, develop, you know, go about a systematic preparation. So, you know, if you can really build your management uh, bandwidth, your financial capacities and your operational readiness and plan your expansion way in advance and, you know, think through every strategic decision, uh, then it's possible to really, that you really don't have to be, um, uh, you know, a growth stage or a later stage enterprise. And uh, one example I can give is of Greenlight Planet, which manufactures and sells uh, solar lamps, for example. And uh, I think they, within the, uh, they started in 2008 in India and, you know, within uh, the next four years they were able to expand to nine they had nine offices across four countries and uh, have been expanding since then um, they also started you know uh, one of the things that i think Rishad was also mentioning is about how thinking about a hub and spoke model where you can uh, you know work from a country and then cater to uh, the, the, the region as a whole for example specifically in africa we've seen where countries go to kenya and then they can think about uh, working in uganda and Tanzania <coughs> nearby markets uh, so, so there. I think uh, one one key, you know, the, the quick answer to this is that the average years does not are not really that uh, that critical. It's about um, your other uh, decision points that have to be taken into account. Um, so that's it. Thank you. So uh, while we are waiting for our thirty plus uh, online participants, and I already see one more question. I just wanted to add a couple of questions from my side for you to answer, and one of them was. You know, the sheer potential of Comcare uh, in, in being an open architecture which can be used for multiple purposes is very exciting. And so is the, uh, you know, the application of this tool uh, in terms of its being able to be used not just for replication of enterprises, but maybe for even a government uh, organization to screen whether I'm, I'm now ready to take on this tool for replication in a public context. So um, I would just like you to reflect on the broader implications of what you both have done in terms of the tool and in terms of the Dimagi application. And meanwhile, we'll collect a few more questions. Thank you. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Somil. And uh, to to build upon what uh, Somil asked in terms of the, you know, our context and our experience in India as well as Myanmar, it's uh, technologically like we, uh, when we were thinking about creating an impact, uh, we knew that impact has to ultimately be created at scale. Uh, you cannot be running a number of pilots in silos. Uh, you have to, you know, ultimately scale it up. And in a number of these geographies, the answer to ultimately scaling this up is working with the public health system and scaling with the government. Uh, so at the very onset, in terms of the decisions that went into designing our platform, whether to make it open source or not, whether to make it user configurable or not, those were uh, taken with scale in mind. 
And that has paid great dividends in all the geographies that we've worked in, uh, in India, in Myanmar. Uh, and one example that I mentioned earlier is, you know, creating this uh, buzz in Myanmar about mHealth uh, and lowering the access to mHealth uh, because we have this uh, user configurable platform that, you know, you would not need a programming background for. Uh, you can have a number of organizations and they might not have the financial capacity to, uh, you know, dip, like uh, invest in uh, our implementation packages, but uh, we have a tiered pricing structure. And, you know, with that, it's, uh, it's, it's been very helpful to uh, take the tool, build it yourself and customize it to your needs and deploy it. So I think that that buzz, that initial buzz is really important in Absolutely. getting it on everyone's radar, and that's been very helpful. So, um, so, so I think this is a very pertinent question because um, you know we we looked at uh, the number of case studies, not only successes that we have documented, but also a lot of failures, and uh, you know we we did not really see a lot of examples where enterprises have really considered government partnership as one of their entry points, except one example where uh, we have a, a agriculture company called as Manasa Agro, which entered Ghana through a government partnership. Um, so, so one, uh, you know, one critical uh, uh, input for us has been that, you know, how we can, how we can catalyze this more. And from the World Bank side, and Christina is here, uh, you know, we've been working together on uh, identifying what these, uh, you know, how we can uh, work in Africa. Uh, you know, we have uh, launched a study on the Africa ecosystem diagnostic to, to kind of map out the different interventions and, you know, enterprises and also then use this to use as a as a basis to talk to the governments to create a more enabling policy environment for inclusive businesses and social enterprises where governments not only look at enterprises from their home country and outside as uh, you know as somebody to support but more on you know how they can leverage their skills and expertise and you know their strengths in last mile expansion uh, you know last mile reach to consider into their existing programs and strategies and schemes uh, that is something that we've been working on and focusing a lot more. And I thank you, Sami, for bringing that question up. I think it's really, really important to consider for us uh, going forward. And I see that you've got all the ingredients for that. And maybe that's what we'll uh, work on together in the in the next version of the tool. But I have an inter interesting segue uh, of, uh, to a question that Sheikh asked as Sheikh works on M Health, And he's asking that East Africa has a more mature market in terms of M Health opportunities as well as the government system's willingness to uh, work with them as compared to West Africa. So how do you manage application from one such context to the other where the maturity levels are different? And maybe Dimagi experience and your tool can both be answers for this question. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, to to build upon this question, we we have, uh, you know, a, a, an in-country team in Kenya and we worked a lot in East Africa and we have a country office in, in West Africa as well. And uh, we've We've tried to, uh, you know, customize our strategies to the specific regions. So, for instance, uh, in East Africa, Nairobi is a major hub, um, and one of the uh, sectors that we were really interested in expanding into uh, was social sales. So, using our product to uh, as a transaction tracking tool, and that could have its use in a number of uh, use cases, including, you know, sale of solar lanterns. Uh, we decided that uh, after a lot of uh, experimentation and a number of pilots uh, in West Africa, we ultimately decided that uh, it's good to uh, use Nairobi as a hub for uh, such kind of uh, business development. And so our social sales team moved to Nairobi to expand that. Uh, in West Africa, the landscape has been different where we've had a number of uh, bigger projects, uh, some projects with the government, um, and that's what kind of, you know, gave us the segue into the West Africa landscape. Uh, moreover, with uh, we did some recent work with Ebola in West Africa. Uh, so, you know, such circumstantial reasons as well as uh, the need from uh, the government in West Africa has, has kind of prompted our, our work there as well. And I would say even your move from India to Myanmar is a very mm -hmm. good example of being able to move across markets with different maturities. Absolutely. A context where 
uh, mobile phones uh, were cheaper than $20 and SIM cards for a few cents to a context where when you started, the mobile SIM card alone was $120. Uh, so it's a very, very different market that you went to, but you have shown Absolutely. that uh, you can work in those contexts. Sure. Um, so replication from East Africa to West Africa, I don't see it very different from any other, um, you know, expansion uh, in between markets. Um, so, so in specifically, you know, we've seen that uh, MPESA originated in Kenya and expanded to uh, all of Africa and other parts of the world. Um, so, so very clearly, uh, you know, it's it's a same similar. Uh, you know, I would again uh, talk back to the same points that I've been mentioning about. Uh, you need to go for a systematic preparation uh, to think about the country context, understand the business dependencies. Um, and also, you know, it, it's great that we have uh, an example of Zimbabwe where we, they have actually tried. Uh, so, so the contexts are very different and, and I completely understand that uh, we can't, uh, you know, we can't really have the same strategy within two countries in Africa. You know, this it's a very heterogeneous market. Uh, so, so it's, it's as challenging and, and you know, as... Uh, uh, resource intensive as it's going to be from moving from India to Africa or India to Myanmar for that matter. Uh, and hence, uh, uh, you know, businesses need to do their own uh, due diligence, uh, understand the dependencies and then think about how they can manage the replication process at a more generic level and, you know, you hit upon the specifics of it and from your example. So that. Thank you, Pallavi. I think we're on to our last minute. So we'll have to follow on the last couple of questions offline. I saw a question from Niamo on adaptation but we'll have to follow it offline. I must take this opportunity to thank both our presenters. Uh, I see some very exciting opportunities for greater use of not only the Demagi tool across geographies and across contexts, but also of this tool that can really be used to more uses than just for replication and maybe as a screening tool for governments to identify. Sure. Thank Done. you, Samuel. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks, so, everyone. So, uh,